Hey there, students. All right. Uh, why do you a chat room to 700 high school students? Okay, we got quite a few in here for a push review tonight. I'm Tom Ritchie, and we are going to be focusing on Unit 2, Colonial America, the time between 1607 and 1754. So basically, our focus area is going to be between Jamestown and the French and Indian War. Anything in there is fair game. Now, if you're on YouTube, go ahead and click the link to join us on Crowdcast. OK, we want to make sure that if you're on YouTube, join us on Crowdcast because that's where I mean, the link is in the description. That's where you're going to be able to ask questions. I look at this chat more often. Um, hey, CBD College Board Dayhan is in the house tonight. All right. We got a little bit bigger of a group uh, than we had last week. Last week, I was a little low key. I want to thank all the teachers that promoted this. And I will be live every Monday between now and the exam at 9 p.m. Eastern, except for next week. I'll be on my spring break. I'm going to take a week off. I will be back on April 5th. OK, so uh, as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, OK, somebody came in here. World War II, okay, writing the perfect, okay, so y'all didn't quite take a look here at the focus area, okay, so now I will do some stuff here, um, as far as that goes, I'll, I'll entertain some questions outside of this if I must, but our idea is to kind of review as we go through. Um, so tonight's focus area is Colonial America. Now it looks like some people are interested in some other stuff. This session is going to be somewhere between 45 minutes and an hour. Okay. Just kind of whenever I, you know, whenever I feel like stopping. So prognostications, whether about whether there will be one DBQ or many like last year, Year, okay, Mr. Laird, thank you so much for promoting this to your students and for joining us. Um, what we're probably going to see here is, uh, you know, probably that, well, actually, we've got multiple administrations. So we know there are going to be at least three DBQs, right? I would say that there could be, if I were to guess, there could be at least a dozen DBQs this year on the exam because you've got three exam administrations. And so I think that you're going to have at least two or three forms of the paper pencil test. The paper pencil test will not be, uh, you know, if, if previous years have been any indication. It won't be the same with everybody. Usually there are about three forms of the paper pencil test. And so going from there, uh, you know, then you think about the online exams where I think you're going to see a situation where there are at least like, you know, four or so DBQs going around. So I would say that we may be looking at anywhere between 10 to 15 different DBQs. Um, now, there was a unit three DBQ last year. Um, but before that, now, I think it might have been like 2017 or something like that, or maybe 18. Uh, when did they have something? Let's see. So a push. Uh, DBQ, or let's see, A push free response 2017. I think that if I'm not mistaken, that in 2017, um, there was a DBQ about the Form O DBQ was about the American Revolution. Yes, that was in 2017. It was the American Revolution. And then it was uh, the last uh, two years, like 2018, 2019. Um, I believe we have imperialism in the progressive era. Um, those were the two there. So now one thing that I'm comfortable forecasting I would guess, okay, now last year, now this is just, take this with a grain of salt, uh, this is just my prediction, um, that last year, even though they said that the exam would go through 1945, right, it would go through World War II, um, I came to the conclusion, I said, look, a lot of schools, a lot of classes were like in the, in, at World War I in the 1920s. So I said that no DBQ is going to go beyond 1900. Like we're not going to see the 20th century. And for the most part, I think that ended up being correct. I think that maybe there was one that went a little bit into the progressive era. But even though they said the cutoff was 1945, they never went past 1910 because I, I was like, look, people are going to be upset. So I would say that there has been a trend this year for people to be going a little bit slower than usual, okay? So I would say that I would forecast that we're probably not gonna see a lot of post-World War II content on this exam, but that's just my guess. Now, let me go ahead and ask y'all, uh, you know, what exam format, uh, format are you expecting to take, okay? So paper, pencil, computer at school, 
and computer at home. Okay, so computer at home. Now, one more question. I'm actually going to put a couple of polls out there. Uh, when do you expect? Okay, so when do you expect to take the A push exam? Okay, so the A push exam, um, early May late May. Now, early May is going to be, if you're paper pencil, y'all are early May. Um, but then the digital exams are going to be late May and early June. Okay. So early May, late May, early June. Let's see what y'all do here. Now, uh, are y'all, we've got a lot of people saying they're going to take computer at home. Now, I don't know. We'll see how many of y'all do that because I think that requires some kind of special permission. I'm not sure how that works though, but we've got a lot of y'all who are saying, yeah, it looks like the majority of y'all are expecting to take the paper pencil. Okay. So with that, that's an interesting thing to see there. So let me go ahead and taking, take a look at this. And um, now another thing that we want to note that we want to note here, um, let's see. Um, discussing uh, Texas. Or, okay, early U.S. chapters two through five. Okay, we've got to train y'all how to ask questions. So is Jamestown important on the exam? What would that look like? Thank you, Sarah, for asking a specific question. Those are going to be uh, for a thing like this where we've got like hundreds of people in here. The more specific the question, the better. Um, so is Jamestown important? Now, Jamestown would be a good illustrative example, okay? But what's more important is that you the biggest thing here is to be able to compare the New England colonies, the middle colonies, the southern colonies, and know some things about each of those things. Now, I would say that Jamestown is very important to note. It's the first permanent English settlement. But what's really important is to think about the economy of Jamestown, okay? So tobacco agriculture, which we can note, the biggest cash crop in colonial America is going to be tobacco, whereas the biggest cash crop in antebellum America is going to be cotton. So this is going to be the big thing like comparing New England, middle and southern colonies. So in New England, you know, you could say how important is Plymouth Rock? Well, whether you know Plymouth Rock, uh, you know, the Plymouth colony, uh, the, you know, Roger Williams and Ann Hutchinson, John Winthrop, the city on a hill. Uh, you need to know basically about the New England colonies. You've got the big picture. And then you need some other, like some specific things within that. Now, the specifics are largely going to be up to you. Um, the more you know, of course, the better you're going to be. But what we want to note about New England is New England was, of course, settled by Puritans and separatists, settled by English Calvinists who were looking to set up basically a religious commonwealth. Now, another thing about New England is New England is the only one of the 13 colonies that is not engaged in commercial agriculture. OK, when we think about commercial agriculture that is engaged in, you know, growing crops for export to other colonies. Uh, so for example, when you look at the middle and the southern colonies, the middle and the southern colonies, um, the middle colonies are much more likely um, to be, uh, you know, staple crops, okay? So when we think about like Pennsylvania, New York, they're growing staple crops, which are crops um, you know, which I, I don't think that I am related to Patrick Dempsey. I haven't heard of that before. Um, but I uh, see the guy on Grey's Anatomy. Is that not that I watched that show or anything like that? Um, so, so with that, you know, in the middle colonies, which was known as the breadbasket, okay, the middle colonies were the breadbasket. And that is where, you know, think about Quaker Oats, for example. Okay. Now, Quaker Oats did not actually come from uh, the Quakers or the Pennsylvania colony, but when they were branding Quaker Oats, it's like, okay, what can we, uh, you know, what can we do that there? Okay, what can we do with Quaker, uh, you know, like, how can we brand these oats? Well, the Pennsylvania colony, that's where they grew oats. Now, I tell you what, now, speaking of some things, um, I've got some stuff that I'm going to be posting on my Instagram account about the differences between the digital and the um, paper pencil. Um, I'm at Tom Ritchie on Instagram. I will be giving shout outs uh, during, the, uh, during the broadcast. I will be giving shout outs. 
Um, so if I've got new Instagram followers, we will be giving shout outs. We're going to be posting a lot of things to kind of keep y'all uh, posted here. Soggy Raccoon, okay, is uh, is following here. So I will be doing Instagram shout outs. So the thing is, Jamestown is a specific example, but you want to note in the Southern colonies, cash crops, okay? Cash crops in the Southern colonies, staple crops in the middle colonies, um, and Quaker oats, middle colonies. Now, the other thing, if we think about the Quakers, you know, the literal Quakers, they settled in Pennsylvania. Now, how much you know about the Quakers is up to you, but you need to know that in the middle colonies, you were most likely to have religious toleration in the middle colonies, whereas in the New England colonies, you've got these folks that came over for religious freedom, but they're only concerned about their own religious freedom. Imagine that, you know, people only care about themselves. They get over to uh, New England and they're like, you know what? We're right. Now we're going to persecute people who are wrong. Roger Williams and Ann Hutchinson, they are the two best examples. Now, can you get by not knowing their name? Sure. But as far as that goes, I find when I'm wanting to illustrate what's going on in the New England colonies, and I've got a YouTube lecture that goes into this, um, is I'm thinking about John Winthrop City on a Hill. They're starting a religious commonwealth. Um, but then again, you've got for, you know, you've got different things you can do. You could bring out this. Nobody's going to ask you on the multiple choice about the Salem witch trials, but uh, you could say something about it in an LEQ or a DBQ. You could say something about the Salem witch trials as evidence of intolerance in the, in the New England colonies. Or you can bring in Roger Williams and Ann Hutchinson, who are both exiled from the Massachusetts colony for speaking out against the consensus, okay? So as far as that goes, now Ann Hutchinson also brings into account gender roles, okay? Because Ann Hutchinson, she was leading Bible studies from her house. And the thing is, today, a woman leading a Bible study, no big deal. But Ann Hutchinson was a woman that people were going to for spiritual leadership, okay? They were going to Ann Hutchinson for spiritual leadership. And so with that, uh, you know, that's something to note there. Now we've got some folks. Hi, my name, Ryan. Oh my goodness, going on a light spree. Um, Isaiah Maldol, thanks for the follow. Um, Elizabeth Herm, thank you so much. Uh, Cassidy uh, Muskowitz uh, is, uh, you know, is joining us uh, today. And let's see that we've got that light spree. It's kind of hard to see who is uh, who is following. Um, Adriana, Ellie Poplar, um, CC Hinkle, and Mossy Thee, um, Blue DNB, Sarah Mercer 09. We've got Bella Sky 23, um, Drew Shaw 27. Um, let's see. Um, Kyler is asking for a shout out in the live. There you go. And uh, Barzano 604, Laura Tanner, um, R period Jasmine. And <coughs> goodness, let me uh, let me stay hydrated here. And Silisk, uh, okay, Silisk. I might have, I mean, it's a written test, right? Um, so we'll do some more shout outs uh, shortly on here. Um, so we'll go ahead and get uh, eParent583 uh, and Patrick Cassale, all right? So as far as that goes, let me go ahead and see, are there any other questions that are here? Now, again, these Monday night sessions are going to be more about content than they are the exam format. I am going to be sending emails to those of you in these sessions, and we're going to be talking about like some sessions that are going to focus on skill-based stuff. So uh, I thought the DBQ was canceled. The LEQ will not be on the online test, okay? The LEQ will not be on the online test, but the DBQ and the multiple choice will be on there the same way. Now, the LEQ is going to be replaced by a couple more SAQs, okay? So as far as that goes, Chloe, as I was saying before, the exam is going to be on all the periods. Now, one thing to note, um, the so-called unit one and unit nine, the period one, period nine, those together, literally, I've got here, they make up together up to 10% of the test. So 90% of the test is between 1607 and 1980. So if you think about what you want to focus on, 1607 to 1980. Now, if you're thinking like, hey, I, I want to gamble a little bit, which I think this is a pretty safe bet, 
I wouldn't expect. Now, I could come back and it's like, whoa, didn't see that coming. But I would not expect that the DBQ is going to be on, especially if you're taking paper pencil. Let me go ahead and make this prediction for paper pencil early May, okay? Because the June test takers have extra time. So let me, especially for early May paper pencil, say, I'm not expecting the DBQ to be on anything after World War II. I would not expect even any of the LEQs. Now, possibly LEQ3, but I think they're going to try to keep it pre-World War II because a lot of people are behind where they normally would be. Okay, so that's something that I would note uh, there. Do I have any other review suggestions? I would definitely ask uh, for, you know, request, uh, you know, say that, advise you rather, um, to follow at Marco Learning. Also, you can go to, uh, you know, tell Miss Kenny to give you an, oh, come on, I'm not going to get into that. All right, so Big Bear 2049 and uh, Nisha Patel. All right, and uh, Shagan and Kieran. Um, thank y'all. Uh, Ali M. Harrell and San Janar 29. All right, is uh, they are following. Thank y'all so much. So as far as that goes, I do want to make sure y'all might want to sign up. Marco Learning is also doing free events. I'm going to go into the chat here and I'm going to post a link to Marco Learning's free events. So there are going to be some things. I'm going to be doing some of these sessions. Some other folks are going to be doing them. Um, so Marco Learning free events. Okay. So you can see here that we've got some things coming up there um, for students. Marco Learning's YouTube channel. So let's go ahead. Let's see where they are right now. YouTube.com slash Marco Learning. And also my channel is, uh, is uh, you know, make sure you're showing my channel some love if you haven't already. They are at 13.2 right now. Um, so let's go ahead and, uh, you know, let's see. YouTube.com slash Marco Learning. Okay. And make sure to uh, show me a little love as well. Okay. So if we're looking, uh, looking there, youtube.com slash Tom Ritchie. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to come to Crowdcast. There's a link in the description because you want to be in this ongoing review group. So definitely, uh, you know, take a look at Marco Learning and then they've got Marco Learning student support as well. Okay. Mom's trying to call during, uh, during broadcasting. She knows better than that. All right. So with that, there's also a premium review, um, Marco Learning student support. So Marco Learning is doing free events and they've got some paid events as well. Um, so in the paid events, I've never heard anybody complain, whether it's been my paid events, whether it's been Marco's, I will have some premium sessions. I'll let y'all know that some of the stuff where I'll do like a DDQ walkthrough and stuff like that. Um, so those are some things to know. Note, uh, to note there. All right. So going uh, with this, yeah, this actually, Ellison, this will be on my YouTube channel and you should be able to access it through Crowdcast as well. But this is currently co-streaming on the YouTube channel. Um, thank y'all so much. Uh, those of y'all who are watching on YouTube. All right. So going from there, let's see what we've, uh, what we've got here. So, uh, Okay, so how were regions different in the colonies? What were, who were the significant leaders? So Adriana, we want to note, remember, first of all, economics, okay, and religion would be the two biggest things that I would note here. Um, so when you're thinking, those are two that tend to come up. So remember, New England, their economy is based more on trade and commerce than anything else. Um, then the middle colonies, their economy is based on staple crops, wheat, corn, stuff to eat. It's known as the bread basket. Think Quaker Oats. Now, again, Quaker Oats did not come from, uh, you know, the middle colonies. But when they branded Quaker Oats, they're like, oh, the Quakers, isn't that so quaint? Um, and then the southern colonies, cash crops, the biggest cash crops uh, in the colonial period are tobacco, rice, and indigo. And, and rice, I guess, was a cash crop because they just didn't, hadn't figured out that you can grow rice all kinds of places in Asia by that time. But tobacco is going to be your big cash crop of the colonial period. Now, remember that periodization is a big thing on this exam. So if you've got a multiple choice question about colonial America, they might put in a, dist a distractor that's got something about cotton agriculture or something like that. And so with that, you want to think about that, yeah, cotton, that's going to be in the early 19th century, early 1800s, about 1820 to 1860s is going to be the heyday of cotton, whereas the colonial period is going to be the heyday of tobacco. Religion, whereas in New England, 
Calvinism, Puritan separatists, one of the biggest figures, John Winthrop. John Winthrop, Roger Williams, and Hutchinson. Those would be my picks for uh, if I'm doing New England. Then when we look at the middle colonies, um, they're going to be religiously tolerant, okay? So you're going to have the Quakers and other religious groups. Another example, if any of y'all are from Maryland, is Maryland in the house? Um, so is Mar if Maryland's in the house, um, what we've got there for Maryland is that, uh, you know, if Maryland's in the house, Lord Baltimore founded Maryland as a haven for Catholics, but he also had a policy of Christian toleration. Maryland economically is a Southern colony because they're, they're doing cash crops. But in terms of their religious life, Maryland acts more like a uh, like a middle colony. Hannah um, Wineglass, thank you so much, and Megan Hampshire and Melanie Hernandez. Also, I tell you what, I want this account to get more followers. There's this account, Harambe Movie. Like they're literally working on a on a documentary about Harambe, and they're posting like these pictures of Harambe. I've got it on my story. Um, Harambe Movie. It doesn't want to focus on this for whatever reason, but if you follow at Harambe Movie, they have like 68 followers. We've got them over a hundred. I'd love Love to push them over 200 followers like we need to show some love like these people are literally making a movie about harambe and we need to support it a couple y'all already did we're up to 106 so hurrah at harambe movie on instagram so as far as the middle colonies i would say that you've got uh peter stuyvesant uh, which, which of course that would have been new netherlands so not by the time the english colonies but i would think william penn uh, would be, uh, you know, would be somebody, uh, you know, that you'd want to know in the middle colonies. And then the southern colonies, I would say John Smith and John Rolfe. Uh, you know, John Smith, of course, uh, you know, the one who gets this thing started. And John Rolfe, the one who uh, was, uh, you know, was basically found this new strain of tobacco. It was John Rolfe, the guy who married Pocahontas, um, that, you know, I think some of y'all may remember that from the Disney cartoon and stuff, right? right? And so with that, you know, John Rolfe develops this new strain of tobacco that people actually want to smoke. So John Rolfe is, is responsible for tobacco as a cash crop. Remember, initially, they were just looking for gold. Um, so if I'm thinking about like my who's who of the colonies, I'm thinking, you know, New England, John Winthrop, Roger Williams, Ann Hutchinson. Roger Williams and Ann Hutchinson as religious dissenters. John Winthrop as establishment. Middle colonies, William Penn illustrating religious toleration. Southern colonies, John Smith, John Rolfe. Okay, and so as far as that goes, now one thing, Luca, I'm going to refer you to my YouTube channel uh, where I want you to uh, look at my video, um, the French and Indian War as a turning point. Now, Marco Learning was at 13.2 when this thing started. Let's see how much Marco Learning, they're still at 13.2. Let's see if we can get them to 13.3. Um, and so with that, um, the French and Indian War, I've got a video on that where we go. I go into the French and Indian War as a turning point. Luca, show that video some love, okay? Um, so with this, um, you know, it really depends on what state you're in, Joseph, it, or Jonas, I'm sorry, Jonas, um, that if you're in New York, I would say yes, that it's going to be like a state test, but harder. Now in South Carolina, our state test is terrible. Uh, let's see. So uh, as far as that goes, Elizabeth, did you just follow me again, like to get another shout out? I think Elizabeth did like the uh, followed me and then she's like refollowing me. Elizabeth Herm, um, Chloe Noble um, and, uh, you know, Sarah and Megan. Uh, actually, I'm seeing this group again. OK, so uh, another Sarah. OK, so, yeah, I don't know what's going on with that. We've got so many people coming in. Thank you all so much. I do appreciate all the follows. And Harambe Movie is now up to 129. We've like almost doubled their followers. Following. So at Harambe movie on Instagram. Um, so with that, don't compare it to the state exam, though. Get to know the actual exam that we've got here. Now, um, as far as that goes, uh, now gender roles throughout history. Remember, the biggest example of gender roles in colonial America is going to be Anne Hutchinson. OK, so when we think about Anne Hutchinson, somebody who was seen as a something of a religious authority by certain people in the Massachusetts colony. Um, so going with that now, also, we do want to know um, the importance of the Atlantic or triangular trade. This is very good, uh, Krisha. Um, what we want to note here is the triangular tra triangular trade, which I usually see the exam refer to it as the Atlantic 
Atlantic economy. Okay, so when you think when you see the words Atlantic economy on the exam, it's talking about the triangular trade. So you do want to be familiar with this overall kind of exchange that's going along with, uh, you know, raw materials from the colonies. Uh, then finished goods from Europe, slaves from Africa, where you've got these ships that are going on, you know, just various things here. Some ships just going back and forth between the Caribbean um, and the 13 colonies. But yeah, the triangular trade, um, you know, of the middle ground. Now, are you talking about, Cretia, the middle passage? The middle passage is the middle passage of the triangular trade, which was the slave trading route that went between Africa and the Caribbean or the West Indies. Um, so yeah, the, the Atlantic trade is very important at this time, and you do see that. Now, one thing, I saw a question on an old A-Push exam that said something about, like, we want to understand that all colonies participated. Um, in in the Atlantic trade. So even though uh, New England is engaging in commerce, uh, you know, the middle colony staple crops, um, cash crops in the southern colonies, all of them are participating in the triangular trade. Um, so with that, um, a let's see here, first great awakening. A push need to know. Okay. I'm gonna share a guide with y'all here. All right, so let me see what I've what I've got here. Uh, yes, the first great awakening need to know. I'm going to put a link to this in the chat. Okay, so I think that going into the first uh, is Viviki here. Is somebody shouting out to Viviki? Uh, College Board Dayhan is Viviki here. Y'all tell me who's who's with the crew. It was just the crew right there. All right, Miss Skinner is here. Awesome, awesome. And so with that, let me go ahead. I posted a link to this. I want y'all to see this was a need to know handout that I made for the first great awakening. Okay. So the first great awakening. Now, of course, there are two great awakenings. Um, I've got something, if you're a teacher, I've actually got a version of this that, you know, you can put for your students that they would fill it out as you're going through it. Um, so as far as that goes, we want to note that the first great awakening was a religious revival in what I would refer to as the late colonial period. Now, one thing, you know, people who know me well enough know that I don't like talking about numbered periods. Not Numbered periods never show up on the exam. It never refers to period one, period three, period five. Um, so what I like to do is I divide these things up. When I think late colonial period, I'm thinking, you know, 1700s to 1750, because you will see where it'll say the early 18th or the early 19th, late 19th century, something like that. Um, Lalia, Anna. Um, has followed. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Basu604. And uh, gosh, it looks like, hi, my name, Ryan, is like trying to like everything I've literally ever posted. Um, thank you, Adam Trimmer, for the Instagram follow. And Harambe Movie is now up to 138 followers. We're getting them some followers. I tell you what, Harambe is finally going to get his movie, and I'm so happy about that. Um, so the First Great Awakening was a religious revival in the late colonial period. You don't need an exact year, but 1730s, 1740s, basically right before the French and Indian War. And so where? This is very important. The entire English speaking world, it is something, this is something we mentioned last week um, when it was just me and the crew because I didn't really promote it, um, that the entire English speaking world, which means all of the colonies and also England, um, and perhaps Scotland as well, but basically England, Britain, whatever. We're Americans. We'll you know call it what we want. In European history. We want to be a little more precise, but Americans are never precise when referring to like England, Britain. You know, does Scotland even exist? If anybody's Scottish, I I've actually got some Scotch Irish um, ancestry. So you know, I'm not meaning to offend anybody. And so with that, now also we need to note when we were talking about the Columbian Exchange last week, ideas are exchanged as well. So it's not just cows and horses, potatoes and tomatoes in the chat. Y'all let me know what a cow says. Okay, I really want to know. Y'all let me know what a cow says in the chat. So cows, horses, potatoes, tomatoes, diseases. It's not just tangible items, but ideas are exchanged as well. So the first great awakening is an example of this exchange of ideas uh, where we see that this religious revival is happening throughout the English speaking world, all of the colonies in Britain. So if you have a question about the first great awakening, Awakening, 
or the second. It's really, these are not regional. These are things that are happening like across the colonies and later on across the United States. Um, and so as far as that goes, uh, yeah, gosh, uh, you know, if only some, fo some folks are really going on some like mad like sprees now, which I appreciate, but I'm trying to shout out new followers. Um, thank you, uh, Kaylee Roll, Kaylee Knoll, Man Dressage, and Brian uh, Nix or Mix, and Rayan is playing. Um, let's see, Isabella um, CN is uh, also, thank you so much for that. Now, who? There are two people that you need to know here. Now, let's see. A cow, what does a cow say? The cow says, did y'all say moo? Okay, I see some moos. Okay, somebody said roar. Okay, so good thing we're not doing AP animal sounds. I want to I wanna teach that class one day. So the preachers that are most famous, Jonathan Edwards, a New England preacher who preached the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now, a lot of y'all have read that, I believe, also like an AP Lit. And then George Whitfield, Whitefield, depending on how you want to pronounce it, he's from Britain, okay? So he's a British preacher who made tons of trips back and forth, okay? Tons of trips back and forth um, between Britain and the colonies, preached in all of the colonies, went throughout and, uh, you know, they this guy, like before you had microphones and stuff, this guy could just preach in the open air because a lot of the churches wouldn't open their doors to him. And he could go out and preach in the open air. It'd be good, I guess, for coronavirus revivals, right? You know, it's like, hey, we're outdoors. You know, I mean, he could preach to a thousand people outdoors and socially distanced and they could all hear it. Uh, and so with that, you know, these two guys are the ones that you're most likely to hear about. That's going to be about, uh, about all you're going to be concerned about. You know, you don't need to know any other names with the first great awakening. Emotional preaching, okay? Hellfire and brimstone. You're going to hell. Uh, that is what you see in the first great awakening, that there is this hellfire and brimstone, emotional experience, and also this idea of a conversion experience within the heart of the hearer, okay? A conversion experience. Thank you, M. Headley and Riley G505 for the, uh, for the recent follows. Itinerant preachers. Now, when you have an itinerary, you are on a trip. You know, you're typically on a trip. Itinerant means you're traveling. So your itinerary is like your travel schedule. Okay. So that's what you're looking at, uh, what you're looking at there. And thank you, Adolfo and DeMarco. Um, let's see. Um, we've got uh, Maggie and Raymond and uh, Arian. Um, thank y'all so much for your uh, for your support. And then we want to note here that it created divisions between the old lights, like the more established types and the new lights. And I think we still have that kind of thing in our in our country today. Like I tend to prefer a more traditional religious service, whereas other people prefer a more like contemporary religious service. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm the first. I mean, I love to go to like, a, you know, a metal show or something like that back when we could still go to concerts. Hopefully we can go to something uh, soon. Y'all go ahead and put in the chat, what's the first concert you're going to go to when you can go to concerts again? Uh, that, you know, I love to go to a metal show, love guitars, drums, all that kind of stuff. I'm not too crazy about having it in a church service. I like something more traditional. That's just me. Um, but uh, the thing is, some people like something less traditional, more contemporary. And this is the same kind of thing. Like the old whites, they tended to be people who were more established, um, people who were part of more established classes. And the new whites tended to come from, uh, you know, less educated uh, you know, less educated groups in society. Now, an exception here would be Jonathan Edwards, who was actually a Yale educated uh, minister and was one of the, uh, you know, behind the founding of Princeton University later on. So now one thing we'll notice, it's influenced by Calvinism as well. Um, so the consequences, an increase in religious fervor in the colonies, a rise of non-traditional denominations such as Baptist and Methodist, and then a decline in established denominations. So a decline in the Anglican church. Now, one thing we want to note here, we want to note the Enlightenment as a concurrent movement. Okay, thank you so much, Lindsay Bernard, for uh, the follow there. And uh, let's see, gosh, Harambe movie is now up to 145 followers. Okay, and so with that, uh, you know, we see here that the Enlightenment is a concurrent movement. Concurrent, I mean that it's going on at the same time, but it's the opposite, okay? Whereas the Great Awakening 
fo the first Great Awakening, well, both Great Awakenings focus on religion and emotion, um, that you, what you have here in the Enlightenment is a focus on rationality. Now, I've got a video on the American Enlightenment, okay? The American Enlightenment, I have a video on that, okay? So that's something you want to note, and I go into Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Paine. But it's very important to note that, you know, in a, you know, you have a concurrent movement here, you know, just like when people study our time, you know, it's like they're, you know, not everybody, you know, likes the same, you know, has the same political ideas today or the same religious ideas. So we want to know that the first great awakening in the, in the enlightenment really could not have been more different. But both of these things are contributing to, you know, ideas that are so important uh, in the United States that I would say that the United States, uh, you know, is heavily influenced by both uh, evangelical Christianity and by the principles of the Enlightenment. So they both add to the American experience, but they are different, uh, you know, different groups of people. Okay. And so as far as that, uh, as that goes, wow, hi, my my name Ryan um, found it all the way to the to my first ever Instagram post in like 2011. How about that? Um, so uh, yeah, okay, so that working really hard. Ox Jasmine, JK JK Photography. Is there an LOL LOL Photography? Ah, <laughs> I cracked myself up. All right, and thank you, uh, Anisha and Justin. Uh, you know, and all of the other good folks that are uh, that are following here. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let me go ahead and uh, see what other questions we've got out here. And uh, let's see. So going from there, uh, let's let's see where we uh, where we are. All right. Excellent. OK, Raul, thank you. OK, so uh, Mr. Uh, Aranaga, thank you so much. He's always supporting my work and helping me out. And that's a teacher question. See, teachers know how to ask questions. And that y'all notice he's been doing, you know, he's also been supporting these, uh, you know, these Corona classes for so long uh, that, you know, he knows how to ask a question that'll get upvoted. So very great question because the exam will sometimes refer to the Chesapeake colonies and the Southern colonies. Every Chesapeake colony is a Southern colony but not every Southern colony is a Chesapeake colony. So Chesapeake, okay, Chesapeake colonies are those colonies that are on the Chesapeake Bay, okay, which is Maryland and Virginia. Now, one of the things I see a lot is since there's a bay, a lot of times people confuse the Chesapeake colonies with the New England colonies in Massachusetts Bay. So the Chesapeake colonies, Virginia and Maryland, that is the Chesapeake. Now, some of y'all are from Virginia and Maryland. Y'all can laugh at the people who get confused. It's okay to laugh at them. Uh, so with this, we want to note here that, uh, you know, during the colonial period, this is where they're growing tobacco. They're not growing so much tobacco in Carolina and Georgia because, they, you know, it's not really made as much for that. OK, so as far as that's uh, as far as that's concerned, Virginia, Maryland, Chesapeake. And also you want to associate this with the upper south. This is what's going to become the upper south later on when you get into the antebellum period. Uh, so this is a distinct part of the southern colonies uh, and remember we want to associate that with tobacco agriculture and it's not in new england okay in fact we've seen some things before where it's asking you to compare the new england colonies and the uh you know and the new england colonies and the chesapeake colony so yeah chesapeake is basically like the upper south so thank you so much i love when the teachers come in here they're asking questions that they know that they just know that their students need to know so again thank you all the teachers who are, you know, supporting this project. Uh, it really means a lot to me. Uh, you know, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, um, you know, we've got, uh, you know, yeah, let's see, um, you know, let's see. The, the Harambe movie is, uh, is thanking us, um, plugging this account um, on a broadcast uh, right now. Okay, so uh, yeah, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, yeah, they're, uh, you know, big fans of mine over at the Harambe movie. Um, so with that, uh, yeah, they're uh, they're excited about their new followers. So thank y'all. Just know that it does matter to them uh, that, uh, you know, if you want to see that, you know, support people who are, uh, you know, supporting Harambe's legacy, definitely. Okay. Puritans and separatists. Actually, I've got a video on that as well, where I go into pilgrims, Puritans and separatists. So if y'all want to watch the video, give it a little thumbs up or something like that. Um, that's uh, that's great. 
So with that, um, Puritans and Separatists, they're all Calvinists, okay? They're all Calvinists, meaning that they're followers of John Calvin. They believe in predestination. They believe in wearing plain clothes and, uh, you know, shun the non-believer, shun, shun. Anybody get that reference? Anybody uh, seen Charlie the Unicorn? If you haven't, you must watch Charlie the Unicorn. Um, so as far as this, uh, as far as this goes, oh my goodness, they should put me in the documentary. Oh my Lord, that is, I need to send that to them. Uh, they need to, uh, they need to, they need to put that in there. You know, that's, I think that that's, uh, that that's great. Uh, I'm going to tell them to uh, make, 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 to use you in the documentary. Uh, thank you. Uh, College Board Dayhan. That is such a great, uh, that is such a great um, idea there. Okay. So that is, that is excellent. You know, so we're going to go ahead we're going to send that to them and, uh, you know, make sure. So with that, uh, you know, so the separatists and Puritans, they're all Calvinists. Okay. So first of all, they're all Calvinists. Now the Puritans, they wanted to purify the church of England. You know, they wanted to basically make the church of England, a Calvinist church, the separatists, they wanted to separate. They wanted to get away. Okay. From the, from the Anglican church. So the Puritans, they still kind of considered themselves like at least attempted Anglicans. Now, this distinction is not like crazy important for a push, uh, but at the same time, it's good to know. Now, also the pilgrims, the pilgrims were separatists. OK, so so the pilgrims, which it would be easier if they were Puritans because it all starts with the P. But the pilgrims were actually a separatist group who spent some time in Leiden in the Netherlands before they came to uh, Massachusetts. Uh, they decided they didn't want to live in a foreign country. Country. They wanted to be English and all of that kind of stuff. So Puritans and separatists, it's a matter of did they want to purify the Church of England or did they want to separate from the Church of England? All right. And thank you so much, Alexander, for the question on the Great Awakenings. Uh, we at least got to the first Great Awakening earlier in the broadcast. Now, one thing that I'm going to note here is when we're comparing the first and the second Great Awakening, they're both hellfire and brimstone, emotional preaching. They both lead to an increase in non-traditional denominations, okay? So they both lead to an increase in non-traditional denominations. And so going from there, um, you know, what we want to look at is the, you know, is the contrast. Now, the, the Second Great Awakening is seen as being responsible for a lot of the antebellum reform movements, such as abolitionism and temperance. Now, the Second Great Awakening, if y'all want to get really deep into it, it comes from a point of view, a religious point of view known as Arminianism, which means you don't have to know the term, but it basically means that you ultimately decide if you're going to heaven or not. I'm going to heaven, Lieutenant Diane. Now, the First Great Awakening, the First Great Awakening is basically Calvinist driven. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. You are hanging by a thread and God gets to decide what happens to you. That is Calvinism, predestination. Whereas the Second Great Awakening, you decide whether you're going to be a good person or a rotten person, or as Charles G. Finney and the burned over district said, a reprobate. Uh, you know, if you decide, you make this decision. So Jesus wants to save everybody. You decide whether you are going to be, uh, you know, accept him and you're going to, uh, you know, live your life accordingly. Or if you're going to continue to be a sorry, like, you know, insert expletive, but don't insert expletive because that would not go along with the evangelical spirit of the Second Great Awakening. So the Second Great Awakening is held responsible for a lot of antebellum reform movements, such as, uh, you know, abolitionism and temperance, because people are trying to make a better world. Meanwhile, George Whitfield, his pet charity project, this is actually still there today. I think it's the oldest charity in the United States. Um, he founded this orphanage for boys in Savannah, Georgia. And uh, because he was so passionate about this orphanage for boys, like he was raising money to give to this orphanage, but he wanted the Georgia colony to be prosperous. When James Oglethorpe initially founded the Georgia colony, um, he did not have slavery there. And so... Whitfield, George Whitfield, he went down there and he's like, why don't y'all have slavery here? 
y'all would have a more prosperous economy and y'all would be able to raise more money to give to my orphanage here. That's my pet charity project. So George Whitfield did not like see anything wrong with slavery. Now that's one thing we want to note that on the eve of the American revolution, slavery was legal in all colonies. It wasn't until the American revolution that we start to see uh, states that are, uh, you know, states that are, not, I wouldn't say abolishing slavery in most cases, gradually emancipating. Okay. So gradual emancipation is what we see there. So, you know, with that, you've got the comparison and the contrast there. And so with that, okay, we got a review of religion. Excellent. Okay. Um, where can we do practice questions and tests? Okay. I will be looking with that now. One, one place, uh, it's going to cost you a little bit of money, but I would definitely go to albert.io. Uh, I think that that is the biggest collection of great, like multiple choice questions. Um, that's something that I would note uh, that I would note there. Uh, now, in answer to the, in response to this question, New England colonies were mostly Protestant, correct? Um, that is all the colonies were mostly Protestant and the United States was mostly Protestant until the arrival of the Irish in the 1840s. Before the 1840s, um, Catholics made up like a minuscule proportion of the, of, the, uh, of the population of the colonies, of the population of the United States. So the Irish were the, and then some of the Germans, and Austrians that came in, uh, you know, some of the German for, you know, German and Austrian 48ers. But the first large wave of Catholic immigration is uh, in the 1840s and 50s. Of course, you got the Know Nothing Party. The second large wave of Catholic immigration is the so-called new immigrants, you know, Italy, uh, you know, from Italy and Poland and other places, you know, the, uh, you know, the former uh, Austrian Empire. So, you know, just note that any time before 1840, we are going to see, you know, very few. I mean, it's going to be overwhelmingly Protestant. OK. And so as far as that. Uh, as far as that goes, uh, we're going from uh, we're going from there. But yes, I'm a big fan. Now, also, uh, y'all remember my Romulus app? Uh, that's something. It's just little trivia questions, but for two ninety nine, I think it is a um, steal. So if you go to uh, you know, let's see, Rom, you know, Romulus education.com, a push, uh, you know, that's just a little two ninety nine app. Uh, let's see, Romulus education. Oops. Um, <laughs> Did our domain, um, oh, oops, we might have lost, oh my Lord, I think we lost our um, domain. Somebody uh, somebody bought it and uh, wow. Okay, so let me just, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's something that was unexpected. Um, all right. Um, Okay, so yeah, it looks like we might have lost our website. Uh, that was, I think that happened to Jeb Bush back in 2016. Uh, that was always interesting. So as far as that goes, um, should I focus on, okay, William, um, what you should focus on, should you uh, focus on um, the economic or religion in the colonial era, I would say both because you don't know what they're going to ask about. Okay. They could ask about either one there. So make sure that you've, uh, that you've got that. So we're going, yeah. So I would not do either, or I would say both because the question on your exam could be about economics. It could be about religion. It's just like, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, I'd say Russian roulette, but it is, uh, you know, it is uh, a push. So, you know, some type of American roulette. Uh, make sure also, ladies and gentlemen, um, I hope that Genevieve, uh, you know, Genevieve LeClaire and Reliquary uh, 22 and um, let's see, Sanyog 4. I hope that y'all are, uh, you know, all going to be following uh, Marco Learning. Go to at Marco Learning. That's also going to be a very, uh, you know, good account to follow. Thank you, uh, Sanya, for the, uh, you know, for the white spree that you did over there. Um, much appreciated there. And so make sure y'all are following at Marco Learning. Yeah, Div, uh, Parthibon, um, Star Wars is the best. Absolutely. I love me some Mandalorian. Okay, so with that, make sure y'all are also following at 
marcolearning.com. That's a great idea for you. So ladies and gentlemen, I am going to be taking a break next week. Um, so I'm going to be on spring break and uh, you know, you'll see me on, uh, on Instagram. You'll get to see where I went if I make it over there. I'm planning on an international little adventure. Hadn't been out of the country in more than a year. It's driving me crazy. Um, so with that, I'm going to be gone next week, but April 5th, we're going to resume our Monday broadcast. Remember to go to marcolearning.com to get some, uh, you know, to get some other sources of reviews. And also you'll be hearing from me in terms of I'll have some other sessions that are aside from these Monday night things. I'll keep y'all updated. And, uh, you know, we'll have some premium sessions as well. And those uh, people always think that that's uh, worth the money. So thank y'all. Uh, thank y'all so much. And I will, uh, you know, be back in touch and looking forward to preparing for this exam together. It's always a pleasure, ladies and gentlemen.